by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Mm. <laughs> Can you hear the man of God speak? There is so much that is encapsulated into this. And I would advise you, uh, if, for those who might read it and still feel a little, you know, uh, like it, it, it's not clear. You can also go over to the NLT version. It pre, it speaks in a modern language. And today, a lot of the scripture that I'm going to throw at you, I will ask you to read it in that version because sometimes you might hear some of the love it and be it and do it. And you're like, ah, it's, it's in a, a language that is not modern. So you can modernize it by going there. But the first thing that Peter is saying here, this salutation informs us that the spiritual leaders are divine gifts uh, from God. Do you see that? Look and, look and read it. Read it for yourselves. Uh, the leaders provide an example to follow. Peter is acknowledging his position when God told him, you, Peter, you love me, feed my sheep. He's now reading out his job description as a leader of God's people. Hear what he's saying. He, he, uh, the leaders are to provide an example to follow, uh, contribute to, uh, to the expansion of the kingdom of God, and have God-given talents, blessings, uh, you see it, where he says in two grace and peace, they have God-given talents, blessings, and the word to share. Mark those things. He's first of all declaring his position and what he has been called to as a leader in God's kingdom. Something that I take very seriously when I read this part, I understand that this has to be the stance of any leader who declares that he's about to lead and, 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 and command God's people as it relates to his word in this time and in this dispensation. So Peter speaks and then I uh, hear uh, the, 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 the earthly source of this message is Peter, one of the 12. He's not perfect, yet uh, he was ch chosen to be leader by God and an apostle. So we know Peter's flaw because we know that he denied Christ, right? We know all of that. We know his situation and we understand what happened there for him. But then we see God uh, restoring him. We see kind of a situation like this happen with Aaron too. After Aaron was there and it was the same Aaron that was at the foot of the mountain that ended up, uh, you know, cut correlating and, and conducting the service where they, they actually um, go to Aaron and Aaron gave them the permission to go ahead and build a calf. And they found the, the, the people of God found themselves in idolatry in the presence of the leader, but God did not give up on Aaron. I don't know what you're going through today. And you figure to yourself that my, my violation has been one too much. I think I've done this too much time with God and I don't think God has any use for me. There is hope for you. There was hope for Peter. There was hope for Moses. There is hope uh, for Aaron. Moses was a murderer and God used him. Aaron uh, was, uh, was one that instigated and stood behind and oversee them the, 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 the a, a production of idolatry right at the foot of God's presence, but God still used him. And from his lineage came the pre, the, the lineage of priests and, and Levites and Levites who operate in the house. So God is saying to you, even as you see here with Peter, Peter was chosen as an apostle. And, 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 and which means that he was a messenger or a representation of God on earth and, and a servant. But you notice how he he used both terms. One is an anointed leader, but at the same time, there is also this subdued, uh, subservient uh, uh, call that he never negates when he introduces himself. I am an apostle, but I'm also a servant. And what does a servant side of him? It means that one who ministers to others unto the Lord. So he knew his calling was not just uh, to be in the seat of the messenger and a representation of God. So remember what the priest was as we studied Leviticus, right? Anybody remembers that the priest is a representation to the people on the behalf of God. And he was also a representation to God on behalf of the people. Peter was saying this apostle position represents that priestly position because now I understand that I'm a servant to the people and I'm also a minister. So I have to stand in this position of being a minister, one that is a messenger and a representation of God to the people. So it's a very esteemed position and he declares that. Peter, 
was well aware of the tension between the two callings and the one ministry. The fact that you are a servant and you're apostle and you still have to be accountable to God and lead his people with, with knowledge and truth according to God's word. So you can't, if you're not receiving from God, you can't fulfill your servant position. If, if, if you are not allowing yourself to speak the word of God to the people, you have failed on, on, on behalf of the, the, the apostle side. So the apostle side is my, my accountability to God. And, and the servant side is my accountability to the people. And on both ends, I have to have integrity. And I have to have, I have to uphold honor and have character as it relates to the word of God, which is my ultimate judge as a leader. Okay, so I've spoken to myself first. So now when the word comes to you, you can say, Pastor is throwing it at us. I have spoken to the office of the pastoral. Okay, let's get on with it. So Peter introduces himself with an awareness of what his posture is in this whole diaspora of this administration of the gospel to the entire world. Mm -hmm. Verse three says something that is very powerful. Through the power of God, we have access to everything we need for life and godliness. I wonder what that means to you. Just continue brewing over that in your mind. What does that mean? What does it mean if we have all power? It is a promise from God to supply all our needs for life and godliness, godliness, godliness. We're going to look at those words separately. Uh, we, are, we are called to reflect God's majesty and glory as we are called to be Christians, called to be Christ-like, called to be his messengers and salt and light to the world. So we are called to reflect God's majesty, his glory, and his goodness, or his excellence, which is his virtue, in the midst of a dark world, so that others might see the light and draw to him. So we have been given a posture that we must stand in to reflect God. So here's the thing. We are like mirrors, spiritual. We are like... Uh, kingdom mirrors all that we do is that we reflect christ we reflect god we stand here when you listen to christ speak as he was talking about his mission and they said to him show us a sign and tell us why you are we must receive you as the as the messiah he says that i don't do anything unless i hear my father speaks why because he was saying i am a conduit of my father this is why now when he goes to his father, he says, now you are going to become a conduit of me. I have sent you. Remember Christ said in the book of John, he says, greater, the person who is sent is not greater than the person who sends him. And he says, I send you. So now that I send you, I am saying that you are going to be a conduit of me. You are going to be a reflector of the things that you see me do. That is what it means when he says that you are going to reflect his glory and his majesty and his virtue in a dark world. We are called to be lights and salt. Mm -hmm. Let me go a little further into this as you follow with me. Keep, keep close with me. We're going somewhere. Uh, as in verse two, we see where our ability to participate in this provision of God is dependent on our knowledge of him. Let's talk about the knowledge. That's where we are, a lot of us are failing because we don't spend enough time to build up ourselves in the word. Okay, so our ability, we say our ability to grow is going to depend on our knowledge of him. It is not just mental knowledge. I think this is where a lot of us are falling off in this day and age. We are striving in our own strength and in our own wisdom. It is not just mental knowledge, but it also encompasses spiritual emotions and will. It involves the spirit. It involves our emotion and it involves our will. It involves the spirit of God. It involves our emotion. It involves our will. So when we come to God and we say that we are, is your 
all on the altar. It means that both your emotion has to come under subjection. Your spirit has to come in oneness with God. Your, 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 your knowledge, everything that your will must be come under, under subjection to God's word. So it's your will, your knowledge, and your emotion must come under subjection to the word of God. That is what the apostle Peter is saying here. It is knowledge that is that willfully and intentionally experiences God. Knowledge that willfully and, and intentionally uh, experience God. The goal is to know him so intimately that we flow in and with the power of God's love. That is the intention. And as Peter gets into it here, this is what we are going to see. And I'm going to walk you through. You know what pastor likes to do. So we are going to interject Christ into this and we're going to show the path, maybe the missing ingredients. As I get through this part, this is where I'm really going to ask you to pull your pens. Evangelist, I'm going to invite you. If you're hearing anything and you want to share right now, go ahead because I'm going to step it through another. I'm, I'm going to turn the corner in this message and we are going to move to a place now where we're going to speak to uh, just how the past the Old Testament of what was represented, just as we are learning in, in the book of the Torahs, as we are going through them, we're going to see the representation of the Old Testament, and we're going to see how it correlates in the New Testament as we dissect this whole uh, empowerment of God's people. Why are we not empowered? How do we get empowered? What was God's plan in the Old Testament? What is God's plan for you in the New Testament as it relates to the release of Christ, God's Christ's death? What does it mean for you? His death is life, is resurrection. What does it mean toward you? And what do we see happening with Peter uh, post Christ's death and pre Christ's death? What do we see happening? Go ahead, evangelist, and share your share. And then I'll go a little further into this. Yes, Pastor. So that verse three, the verse three A, so to speak, is what jumped out to me when it says, um, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for a God. We need for living a godly life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it makes you think to say that, okay, I have everything. We have everything we need to live a godly life. So why is it that many times we still don't live a godly life? Of course, we know there are temptations. We know that there are tests. We know that there is trials. But I think part of it has to do with the exchange. You know, the exchange of God giving it to us and we receive it. And I was reminded, as we always use the example of to say, okay, you have a rich uncle mm -hmm. and he has left you a will with millions or even mm -hmm. billions of dollars of possessions. Oh. You know, we know that love of money is the root of all evil, but money answers all things. So of course you're gonna like, okay, there's a lot I can do with this million mm -hmm. if you knew about it mm -hmm. and if you actually received it. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a transfer of wealth to you and there also has to be a receiving of the wealth, but there also has to be the knowledge of it. So as you touch on knowledge, as you said, if I don't know that this uncle leave this money for me, this money is going to be sitting in this account waiting for me to take it off. So he's giving me all, this uncle is giving me all I need to live a comfortable life. Mm -hmm. He has given me all I need to live a life comfortable, but I will keep being squandering. I'll keep probably not owning the things I want. I'll be keep walking in luck. If I'm poor, I'll be, God forbid, keep being a beggar, not knowing that all that I need to live comfortably is there, but I just haven't tapped into it and received it. And that's what I'm thinking when I say, listen, by his God, the divine power, God has given me everything I need for a godly life. So it makes you think to say, okay, am I taking advantage of everything he has given me? Am I reaping all the benefits? Have I just, has he left me 10 million and I have only found out about one and using one? Mm -hmm. And it makes me, it makes me say, listen, everything God has for me to live a godly life, I want to make sure that okay. I lay hold of I it. I want it. I want to <laughs> make sure that I'm making use of it. And I don't want to be shortchanged. I'm sorry. Everything that I need to live this godly life, I want it because I don't want to do it on my own and in my own flesh. So whatever he has for me, however he packages, however he has presented to me, give it to me. Let me lay hold of it, please. Whew. And thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was, I felt the anointing on that. That was, that was powerful. Uh, this is, this is the thing about it is that Peter understood what it is to walk with Christ. 
and yet not when it comes to the pivotal hour of purpose you take off i mean we have a, a battalion of men and disciples women that were around christ and when the time of god's hour came he was like why can't you guys pray with me because without the empowerment without this knowledge without this will of heart without this emotional commitment and subjection when you put both your will your mind your heart your emotion your spirit under subjection and in your own strength you're going to find that you can't in your own knowledge you can't it's a surrender let's move on as we get into this posture so what is the goal here the goal is to know him so intimately that we flow in and with his love and power. That is what we are heading. That's a destination we're heading for. But we're going to know the how. Sister Miriam asked it today. We're going to learn the how. How do we? That's the thing. So let's move into it now. So the ability to grasp such a lofty goal is not left to our own abilities. That's the first thing you have to come into realization, that you don't have this, the knowledge, nor the wisdom, nor the understanding to do this on your own. You could be walking with Christ for three years. You could hear all his teachings if you have not received the empowerment. Like Peter, like those apostles, no matter how much word you have heard, until you have come in contact, with the resurrected savior and the Ruach Akadesh, mm -hmm. the power that is on the inside. That's why Christ did not speak to you and say, you have no power. He says, greater is he that is in you. He didn't say you are greater. It is the power, it is the Ruach that is inside because lest you think within your own strength and arrogance, that you can fight this battle in your own flesh. The, the word of God says uh, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Uh, it says that we don't fight uh, a carnal battle. It's not flesh and blood. We don't fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers and, uh, of, 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 and darkness of this age and this world that we live in. And he says now, he goes on to say that therefore we must Pull on those weapons, <laughs> those spiritual weapons. Let's get into the word. We are the recipients, we are the recipients of the very great and precious promises that you see mentioned in four. In four, you hear it read, it reads there. You hear what the scripture says, whereby are, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises let's talk about those so if we are saying and we are highlighting the first note you want to make is that we are the recipients of this great and precious promises you are the recipient put your name there i wayne stoddart i am i am the recipient of this great and, and precious promise that Peter speaks of. He says, you, the church who have accepted Christ, this is your, your heritage. As evangelists just explained, it is a will that is left. It's a will and testament of God that you have this power. Let's get into it. Mm -hmm. So this is the first thing you have to know. You have rights to it. It's a covenant we're talking about. So you are rightfully the person who is on the other end of that will. And so it is your God-given right to have this power and to have this privilege and to have this great and precious promise. Mm -hmm. uh, let's look in the Old Testament. We're going to go through some scriptures now. Let me get to my scriptures. So the first one we want to jump to, I want to say the first scripture that God says in the Old Testament, the Old Testament is full of promises. Let's put it that way. All of these promises that God made. Remember, we are studying the Torah. You guys who are in Bible study, you know, it, it's, it's, this is more of a, 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 a jog. In, we, we stroll through on, on Wednesday nights. And, and so you want to be a part of that when you can really get in and lean in and, and, and we can, you know, dissect and get into the meat and the, and the gravy, get into the gravy of the word. All right, let's talk about this. So the first, uh, we want to look at these promises that are mentioned in the Old Testament. I'm going to give you some of them. 
because Peter is speaking to some things that he's, he's expounding on here in verse four. And I want you to understand that he's not just speaking in just current terms only. He's speaking to that which was promised and that which is fulfilled. Let us look at it. So the Old Testament is full of promises, the Old Covenant, uh, promises of deliverance. Let's go and you see in Psalm 32 and verse seven, the first one I'll put out, Psalm 32 and verse seven says, for you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with the song of victory. Mm -hmm. So we know that God has declared himself through his promise in the word, through the prophet David, that he is our what? He is our, he's going to protect us from trouble and surround us with a song of victory. This is God's commitment to us. Promise, we said that you are the very, what? You, you are a part of this promise that God has established. And I'm going to show you today. So Psalm, the psalmist is telling you that God promised deliverance. Now healing in Isaiah 61 and verse one, these are some of the things that God has promised you. These are some of the, 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 the what you say, the conditions that God has, inter, uh, that has written in, in the covenant for you. The covenant is an agreement between you and God. And God is saying in his old covenant that, listen, this is what I promise. I promise deliverance. Go and check it in Psalm 32 and verse seven. I promise healing. Let us see what Isaiah says. Isaiah 61 and verse one. And it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, uh, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor and to set uh, uh, and, 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 and sent me to comfort the broken heart and to proclaim the captive and to set the captive free and to release the prison bars and to free those who are bound. Mm -hmm. So we see here that God is saying that I am in the healing business, I'm in the deliverance business, and I'm in the hope business. So the three words you want to get, God is your, is your God of deliverance, is your God of healing, and is your God of hope. The God of hope, let's go to Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29 and verse 11, he speaks about the hope. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, says God. Mm -hmm. he's not talking about anyone but those who believe in him why are we believing and not getting the power he says i have a plan for you and you need to know this plan says jeremiah in jeremiah 29 and verse 11 he says for i know the plans i have for you says the lord they are plans for good and and not for disaster uh to give you a future and a hope mm -hmm. so he's a god of hope and he has a plan of hope for you Mm -hmm. So we are seeing all the promises that God has stored up for his people. Remember the promises? A promise of deliverance. A promise of healing. A promise of hope. I just gave you three scriptures a while ago. Keep them with you. And that's the promise that God did. So here is it now. How are these promises fulfilled? Before we get there, <laughs> how are these promises fulfilled? Anybody knows? The promises are fulfilled through, through one and only, and that is a living, the son of the living God, Yeshua Amashiach. Let's get into the word. So I don't want to just tell you this and you don't see it. For Second Corinthians uh, 1 and verse 20. Let's see what the apostle Paul says about how these promises, the promise of deliverance, the promise of healing, the promise of hope that was made by the prophet Jeremiah, by the psalmist David, and also by Isaiah, the eagle-eyed prophet. Let's see what Corinthians says. Corinth, 2 Corinthians uh, 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 1 and verse 20 says, for all of God's promises have been fulfilled in who? Yeshua Amashiach, as a resounding yes. Mm, I love this. In other words, all the promises of God, if you're reading it from the, from the King James Version, I'm reading from the NLT, all the promises of God are yea and amen. He's saying yes and so let it be. God says my promises that I've declared in the old covenant. So evangelist, what is this telling me? That if people have not known, why is PLM going through the old covenant? Because if you don't understand what was promised, how will you know when it's delivered? 
I'm wondering why people don't get it. That's if you don't go back and read the top of the contract and understand what the conditions were. How are you going to know whether or not you meet the terms? And so God is saying, I am telling you through the mouth of the apostle Paul that uh, for all the promises that I have made, go read them in the, in the Torah. Go read them in the Psalm. Go read them in the book of the prophets. All the promises that I have made uh, have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes, and through Christ, our amen, which means yes, yes, yes. What is it that you're asking of God? The hope, the deliverance, the healing that you're seeking, God has already said yes to it, through Christ. And so God is saying to you today that all that you desire, the promises have been written and they have been stored up in the book, but have you brought yourself to understand what is said about you when you go through your, 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 your turmoils, when you go through your confusion, when you go through uh, the lust of your own heart and the lust of your flesh and the lust of your, your eyes and the, and the pride of life, when all of these three core sins come and encroach upon you, are you able to go back and see what the promise is and see how the promise has been fulfilled through Christ? Let's talk about the fulfillment. Let's get to another scripture that speaks about it. Uh, now we see the promises are fulfilled through Jesus us through Yeshua Amashiach, uh, 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 as, as are the New Testament promises of our salvation. So two things, the promises of the healing, the promises of the deliverance, the promises of the hope, all of that is fulfilled, says uh, Paul in 2 Corinthians 1 and 20. Then we look at the book of Acts, Acts 4 and 12, and Acts 4 and 12 speaks also to another fulfillment, for, and when you go over there, it says, for Jesus, Yeshua, is the one referred referred to in the scriptures they are talking about in the torah if you go to the root word it's saying that yeshua amashiach is the one who is referred to in the torah are you guys see this in your bible go to acts of the apostle 4 and verse 11 2 to 12 all that was written in the scriptures uh of, of yeshua has, has been fulfilled we're referring to a uh, 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 yeshua where it says a stone that the builders rejected has now been made the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under the heaven by which we must be saved. So Christ becomes the fulfillment of all the promises of the Old Testament. Why do we study the comprehensive word of God? Because we want to understand what the promises are. We want to be able to realize when they're being fulfilled. Hear what John says. It does not only stop there that in our current life that Christ is, it, the promises are going to be fulfilled in this dispensation, but it transcends to say also in the second coming. And in the book of John, John speaks about it in John 14 and verse 3. When it says that uh, when everything is ready, Christ is speaking, I will come and get you, that you will always be with me, that where I am, you may be also. That is what Christ is saying. So he's saying, even though the story is all fulfilled and all the promises are fulfilled in your life right now, uh, you are still understanding that to be continued in the eternal, eternal, I am coming because I prepare a place for you and the promises are still going to continue and they are going to be fulfilled there. And Second Thessalonians 4 and 17 says it this way, uh, then together with them, uh, we who are still alive and remaining on earth will be caught up in the clouds uh, to meet the Lord in the air and we shall be with the Lord forever. So all of these promises that has been promised in the Old Testament is come now to fruition in the new and we see where it doesn't just uh, start with your, with your birth and ends with your death, but it continues into the eternal. I want to show you the eternal covenant that God promised to who? All right, let me see my Bible study scholars. Anybody know who God made the eternal covenant with? It was with Abraham. <laughs> Abraham from the book of Genesis. He said, this covenant shall be an eternal covenant. 
Eternal means forever, means that even after, after death, this covenant will still come because through thy seed, I will give this blessing. So this is a promise that has been promised from the Old Testament coming all the way across. I want to read from verse 5 through to 7, Evangelist. Go so I can wrap this word up. I'm just going to take another 10 minutes and close this out. Go ahead. Second Peter 1, verse 5 to 7 from the NLT version, and it says, In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence mm -hmm. and moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control mm -hmm. and self-control with patient endurance and patient endurance with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love for everyone. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. So dear brothers and sisters, Work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things and you will never fall away. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Selah. So did you hear the scripture says, do these things. And you will never, never go off course. This is the promise. Okay. So Peter is now telling you, I know what it is to waver. And I know what it is to stand fast. And I'm, I'm talking from a place of authority. I've experienced both. And this is what you do. So here is speaking to something that is the essential glue that's going to keep you on course. And for this last 10 minutes, I'm going to give you the weapons as to how. How do you prevent becoming that wishy-washy, that wavering Christian? How do you become that one who is not just the hearer, but the doer of the word? It is called godly character. That's the word you want to put down. And then we're going to talk about character. Character is best understood as who you are when no one else is looking. Can I say that again? Character is best understood as who you are when no one else is looking, you are by yourself. Mm -hmm. It is who God knows you to be. Mm -hmm. And that is the reason why when God is looking for a man, he's not looking for people's recommendation as they did with Saul. Because man looks at the outward. Mm -hmm. But God says, I look at the heart. Because God is not a respecter of your stature. I don't care if you look like you have been chiseled uh, from, from Mount Everest. God says that doesn't make you qualified. I'm looking for a little boy that is, is, is ruddy and, 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 and look like, but his heart, his heart is just in, in such a place that his integrity is what you call the character, is what God judges. So, as I said before, it is God knows you for who you truly are. Character governs conduct. So it's developed. Its development is crucial and God is really vested in the development of your character. While you are asking to say, Lord, 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 we want manna. Lord, 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 we want fish. Lord, 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 we want meat. Lord, 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 we want this. God is saying my prerogative with you is about character. I want to form godly character in you. So character governs conduct. So its development is crucial to the spiritual health of any believer. To do your spiritual health check, start asking yourself, uh, who am I when no one is looking? 
am I the person that God, the person that God sees? Is that the person that God will smile at and say, well done, my son, my daughter? Mm -hmm. That's how you check your spiritual health. Each of these qualities build on the previous. These qualities that you see that are going to be highlighted here in the scripture in verse 5 through to, uh, to 7. Uh, each of those characters are building on the next. So we're going to walk through the progression to see how it, that's why when Paul said walk in the spirit, this is what it means to walk in the spirit. It's walking in godly character. As you walk out one, you step to the other level. And as you walk out, so in other words, they are conditional. I, I speak often from the point of like being a programmer. If you're writing a condition in, in, in computer language and, you, and the condition at the top is not met, you can't get to the next position. So therefore, they are conditionally connected. Uh, each of these qualities build on the previous mentioned one. They all start with what? With faith. Because faith is a starting point. It begins at the top of the scripture there that evangelist just read with faith. So let's get through now and say faith is the starter, but then what's the first thing in it? The first quality is that moral excellence, which is considered to be virtue. Do you see it in your Bible? It's there. Go and look at it. Go and look at it. Keep your eyes in the scripture. We get into it. For God is not looking for people who simply do right. He's looking for people who do right because they are right with him mm -hmm. that's a difference not just saying that oh i'm a righteous person because i do right no you do right and the purpose for doing right must be that you want to be in right stance with him evangelist let's go over to uh, second chronicles and let's look at 25 second chronicles 25 and 2 and if you read that there it's going to give you a little bit of insight there on what that says uh second chronicles uh, 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 uh 25 and 2 it says it's about it's about Amaziah. And I, I'll read it. Let me I have it right here. Amaziah did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, but not wholeheartedly. You see that? That is the thing that we, when you go through all of Kings and Chronicles, most of the kings and chronicles that sat on the throne of uh, all the kings that sat on the throne, not chronicles. The book of Chronicles and Kings talk about the kings and their reign and how their reign were, were, were quantified and scored in God's book. And every time you look, you will see uh, who measured up. They did not walk in the ways of their father, David, because their heart, their heart, their heart, their heart. So it is the wholeheartedness. It's about pleasing the Lord. Uh, wholeheartedly, your heart being engaged. It's not just about an action of right. <laughs> because that's why the Bible says that your righteousness is like filthy rags. So character goes deeper than just doing the right thing and having a corrupt heart. That's why 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 13 says that, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, if love does not fuel what you do, it profits you nothing, says God's word. Let me speak through this because I'm running out of time. So now we move to the second inner quality. So we said the first quality is moral excellence. God is looking for people who are not simply looking to do right, but want to be in right stance with him. The second inner quality is that is, is insight and God and understanding. Insight and godly understanding. It is knowledge uh, and that discern God's nature, will, and purpose and continually develops from being immersed in God's word and the flow of the spirit, the Ruach Elohim. Uh, thus, it is aware of the spiritual force at work and knows how to effectively counteract them through the help of the Ruach Akadesh. So we, as I say before, it is not by your might. It has to be that you are being led by the spirit. And being led by the spirit means that you have to come into obedience and in agreement. This is a key word. You have to come in agreement with God's covenant and his word. Hmm. 
Let's move on with it. The third quality, because I got to speak to this, we're out of time. The third quality is discipline and self-control. Read it there. It's there in, 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 in 2 Peter uh, 1 and verse 5 through the 7. The second quality is self-control. I taught an entire lesson about that. Go back and, re and, and listen to that teaching. It's about the, uh, the forgotten fruit, self-control. It's something that is not very popular, temperance in this time and in this season. Uh, the, it, it, uh, it, it, it will... It is willful, willfully placing the desire of the flesh in submission to God. This is, when it comes to self-control, it is about flesh. It's about you bringing your flesh into, into oneness and submission to God, to God's word. The 14 equality that, that he mentions here is persistence, perseverance, or as you, as you know it today, patience. Uh, Christians growing must remain loyal uh, to the faith and promise of God despite the circumstances. And to cap this off, the last inequality that is mentioned is godliness. Godliness. This is a decision to live in a way that is always conscious of God's provisional presence, his provision and his presence. You are always in a mindset of awareness that God is there and God is my provider. God is there. I'm not alone. And he's my provider. God is there. God is my provider. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a consciousness of God's provision and his presence that you constantly walk in. And so because of that, you have this godliness about you that everything that you do, you do through the binoculars, through the lens of the fact that God is with you and he is your ultimate provider. It is, it is leading a life that is a visible testimony, testimony of God and bring him all the glory through your character, through the things that we spoke of. Everything is channeled towards bringing glory to Elohim. Why is faith the starting point of the Christian walk? Because without faith, it is impossible to get to any of these godly characters. This is how you walk out. This is how you avoid being a lukewarm Christian. You have to step into the character of Christ. You have to move in faith. faith. You got to have moral excellence, which is called virtue. You have got to have understanding and insight, knowledge of God's truth and his word. You have to have discipline, self-control, temperance. You have to have a, a persistence, per perseverance, which is considered to be patience. And you have to have godliness that caps it all off, which means that everything that you do is with a mindset that God is my provider and God his presence is always with me. He's always watching. That keeps our integrity in check. God bless you. Go ahead, evangelist, and take this home. Sorry, Pastor. I didn't know that my mic was muted. My apologies. But um, it's such a powerful message, Pastor, and such a powerful reminder. And practically, what, what does this look like where that Pastor Wayne is saying? How does this apply to our lives as believers? Even as we said, once we become born again believers and accept Yeshua as our Lord and Savior and have repented and purpose in our lives to follow him, we receive what is called the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in our lives to teach us and to lead us in all truth. Practically, as I'm reminding us, Pastor Wayne Speed, how it happens is that the Holy Spirit will prompt us towards these things that Pastor Wayne is speaking about. He will prompt you to say, you know what, this is an opportunity to exercise your faith. He will prompt you, you know what, this is a choice to exercise moral excellence. But what happens is that each time you decide not to listen to the prompt, the voice of Holy Spirit and to choose your own flesh and to choose your own way, you have quenched the Holy Spirit in some respect. This week, doing a devotion, um, it spoke about how the spirit of God himself left the temple. You know, the prophet Ezekiel spoke about how the spirit of God gradually left the temple. It says that it left um, the, the, the holy of holies. It's like it sat upon the outside. And I think it eventually goes on to be in the east on the mountain, how it 
gradually left the temple. And if we are not careful, the spirit of God can seem to gradually leave us when we quench it. You know, if we choose not to act upon our faith to develop the moral excellence, if we choose not to eventually transition to knowledge, to transition to self-control, to transition to patience, godliness, godly fiction, then we will not be growing. The Holy Spirit is here to teach us all things, and as he teaches us that, then we grow. In practicality, in summary, what Pastor Wayne has outlined through the word is steps to grow. If you are a born-again believer, you say, you know what, I've been saved 10, 20 years, 30 years, but I have not been growing in my faith. I have not been growing spiritually. This is the key to grow. Remember this verse, copy it, put all the short steps that I have in the chat, put it on your mirror. Every day you said, you know what, was I tested in this era? Am I still just at the baby level, the faith level where I'm having just milk? Am I at the mustard faith level or have I graduated to moral excellence? Have I, is my character in check? Have I shifted to self-control? Have I passed affection? Oh, I still need to work on the bodily love area. But when you can work yourself through these steps and you see at the end result, like, oh, eternity is my goal. As he preached today, as he taught you in the word, he has made that goal clearly. Many of us, we need a goal. We know, of course, we have the entire Bible and the word is there. But what Peter has shown that, listen, I am kind of, truncating it for you so that you can say, listen, these are the steps to walk in the spirit. If you are not, if you are not a born again believer, if you're not even at the first step of faith, I'm giving you that opportunity to do that right now. You have that choice and that chance today to partake in what we are speaking about today. It starts by surrendering your life to the Lord God Almighty. It starts by, first of all, acknowledging that, you know what? I am a sinner. I have sinned. I want to repent. I don't want to continue on the path that I was walking on. That path leads to destruction and death. If I was supposed to lay out the steps, as I have mentioned for the believer, your step, sadly enough, it would be destruction and it would be hell. But John 3, 16 says that, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, no matter who you are, no matter what you have done, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It goes on to say that God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him may be saved. You have that salvation opportunity right now. This is the moment and the chance that you have to turn your life around to make a 180 and go in the opposite direction. It starts by saying, you know what, Lord God, I surrender. I have sinned. I, I, I didn't know how serious this thing was. Forgive me. Wash me. Cleanse me. Deliver me. Set me free. And I invite you Yeshua, Amashia, Jesus Christ, into my Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can you guys hear us? Yes, yes, yes we can. So can you, oh, yes. For a moment, it felt like we had a, a drop in the internet. So I was just trying to make sure. All right. I thank believe you guys. we lost Minister um, Evangelist Dan. Evangelist, Dan. okay. Because I know that I saw her went quiet. So I was just checking in to make sure that we're still on. All right. Bless the Lord of oh my soul. So today, God's word is very clear. Um, the Spirit of God is, is, is leading me to go on a, a few how, how do I messages. And um, we're going to continue this. We're going to continue this because I want you to understand the divine calling. 
I want you to understand how to maintain godly character. We want to understand that we have been given divine power. This week we talk about the power. The power is what kept, um, you know, um, Peter. That was the difference between Peter of old and Peter now. And he speaks about that. And it's 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 uncanny that at the introduction of the book, he has just uh, uh, compacted so much uh, tools there to give us as to how we can move from the from the that to this and and get to this place in our in our spiritual walk. Um, but most of all, really, one of the things that I really want to underscore for us is that we have to understand that the agape, we're going to speak about that. We got to understand this brotherly love. As we look at this, we're going to continue this teaching next week. We're going to get in the love that God is calling us to as a body, because this just speaks to the whole first part of it as to how we deal with ourselves. But it's a twin love. It's a but your Bible says that you should love others as you love yourself. So there's people realize, don't even realize that in the love of others, there is interwoven. God is telling you to also love yourself. People don't realize that it is there. We just hear love others, but we don't hear when it comes to love ourselves, we just cark our ears. We don't even hear that part. But it's saying, as you love yourself. So love each other. Love each love each other, but love yourself also. And God is giving you these tools this week as to how to build and form that godly character yourself work on you first and then the next step is going to be about the brotherly aspect of it and we're going to see how next week we're going to move into verse eight and nine and look all the way through and bounce over even to um we're going to get into some of matthew and we're going to talk about how do i take the steps the necessary steps for this spiritual growth this is just the introduction as you talk about personal growth today we really want you to stay in tune I believe that God is going to use this to shift you to a new dimension. Those things that you've struggled with, those stronghold, it's not, it's by design. It's the skid mission of the enemy. He is trying to keep you there. And God says, I've given you power. And this power is going to move you. This is just about us and our personal. As we move to the to the outward and this and the horizontal, we are going to deal with how do we gain that 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 to that point where we can move into this the steps to grow with each other. If you notice in this teaching today, one thing I say before I close out: if you notice in this teaching today, all the steps that were given as Peter gave them progressively, they lead they start with internal transformation. And then it moves to the outward. Then he starts talking about godly, godly brother, godliness and brotherly kindness. And then he starts talking about the things that you can see evidently based on your action. So it starts with an internal transformation. Then it moves to an outward thing. Because remember what we say, out of the abundance of the heart, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And as a man think it, so he becomes. We're going to get into those things. So come next week, God's willing, we are going to really lean in a little deeper. Invite a friend. If you think somebody else could use these tools, I implore you to invite a friend. And please connect with us on our website, purelovedministries.org. Also, uh, we are out there in social media. Just look for us at, at the 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 at this the, the the administration team. At this point, is socializing those information. You'll see it on your screen. You'll see it in the chats. Uh, go ahead and connect with us. Let us know that this word uh, ministered to you. Let us know. Give us some feedback as to teachings that you want to hear, so that we can really move into them. I heard today somebody mentioned forgiveness. We are gonna teach that lesson. Uh, let us know where you want to go with the teaching because we are here as servants. Servants, yes, an apostle with an anointing from God to bring the message of truth to the nation, but we are servants to the people. And we want to honor you as God speaks to you directly in the areas that you need strengthening. This is the word of the Lord to you today. And we pray that the Lord will continue to move with you and bless you in all you're doing and you're going out and you're coming in, that you may experience the abundant life that Yeshua died to give you access to. Uh, God bless you. Thank you again for being with us today. God loves you. And so do we. Have yourself a wonderful day.